ahead and we're going to move on to the next segment, which is off-camera flash. Now, I've had a million questions about this, and I promised my SPU students I would get after this and get this posted on SPU. So I will get these images up. I think I promised that like a week and a half to two weeks ago. Uh, but we've been working on this project, and I haven't been able to do so. So I thought I would throw this in here and at least give my SPU students a chance to look at what I'm doing as well as, um, you know, explain sort of what I've been doing and work from there. So what we're talking about today, most of you know I have I use the Canon Mark III. Uh, it is definitely my camera of choice. I try, I know that a lot of you know I'm sponsored by Canon, but I was a Canon shooter long before Canon uh, recognized me. And so I want to make sure you understand that this is certainly not to sell equipment. I believe in Canon, but I never try to sell people equipment just based on an upgrade because I think that I'm a believer that if you have it and it works, keep using it because going into debt and investing is not necessarily a great idea. Upgrading is important and I think people should consider it, but it's not that you have to have every bell and whistle that comes out. However, when this camera came out, there were just a lot of things, especially in the video world that we'll talk about later. In fact, Brandon will be teaching a class um, eventually on video production. He's going to talk a lot about this camera and um, you're going to hear about the bells and whistles. But this is one where I felt like the upgrades were worth it and I have not been disappointed. The focus alone is unbelievable on this camera. So uh, if you haven't had a chance, go down to your local camera shop, check it out, touch it, feel it, play with it. And if you're considering, this is definitely what I'd rec recommend. The lenses that I'm using for these next few images so the 24 to 105 was the primary for most of the shots. Every once in a while, I think only maybe one time in this series did I pull out my 70 to 200 2.8, which is the standard that I use. Uh, the flash system, we have the new Canon flash system. I'm going to move this over here. Uh, this is the 600 EXRTs. I am in love with this system. I cannot even begin to tell you. Um, I had the 580, uh, before, 580s before this. I use them, but nowhere near as much as I'm using these. I'm almost using these every day, all day on outdoor work. And we still are shooting outside, even though it's freezing cold here in Colorado. We will very soon start to do snow portraits. And I know these are going to make that job so much easier. But these are the 600 EX RTs. Uh, you can see that we have a little modified bracket system here. And I don't have the name of this bracket system, but Brandon can definitely get it to you. If you ask on Facebook, I can let you know where we got this. Um, but this is actually something we got as a video tool and we've been able to use it for the dual flash. We do use mo uh, modifiers on them. If I'm using a single unit, uh, we have the Lastolite uh, modifiers and we're loving those. There's several other versions that we have and in another show we're going to talk about modifiers. But all of the images that you're about to see were all shot with bare flash, no modifier um, because this I was testing something out. We're going to talk about the negatives and the positives of that. Uh, we also are using the STE3RT. This is the transmitter um, and of course the flashes become the receiver. So this goes on the camera and we're firing the flashes. Your question is why would I need two flashes? Well I use two flashes in the case of super bright lights. Um, each of these draw a certain amount of battery power and if I can use two of them I'm going to use less battery power. So we're going to wear out those batteries a little uh, uh, less, less fast. So this is the equipment that I'm using for all of the images uh, that you're going to see. If you have questions, we can answer those in just a minute. But I want to jump in, talk to you about what we were doing. Uh, when I got this new flash system, first of all, I was thrilled because these are radio transmitters. So the signal system that they use is radio uh, signals, which is wonderful because the uh, you're just not going to have the disruptions that you would have with any of the other of the uh, line, of, line of sight infrared flashes out there. So my first thing hearing that they were radio frequency was incredible because I knew that that would solve a lot of the problems that I was having. Uh, the other thing is they have built-in high-speed sync options. So this opens up the door to pretty much everything I ever wanted. I've tried different receivers and transmitters in the past. Um, there are a lot of good ones out there. We've had some success with some that we've talked about in the past. But the nice thing about this is it puts all of it into one package. Instead of buying separate radio receivers and transmitters, I now can fire these um, without any other additional tools, which again, it's a cost measure. It's, it's a matter of you deciding what do you already own and is it more economical for you to upgrade and get this whole system or are you better off to use uh, separate radio uh, and radio, uh, I'm sorry, transmitters and receivers. And that's something that you each have to decide based on economics. So the idea here is we did a series of images for some of my good clients, um, one of my favorite locations, but this location is very hard to shoot because there is no coverage whatsoever. And you're at the top of a hill and there's a big mountain out there and it's beautiful and I've always had this vision of making this happen, but I've just not had the technology to do that. Um, I can bring in like big powered units with batteries, but I'm frankly, 
It's not that I'm lazy, but I like to streamline things. I'd like it to be easy and mobile. So bringing the idea of bringing a big battery pack at, the, at this particular location, we're hiking a bit, is not that convenient. Uh, so I definitely didn't want to have that, and that's kind of what's kept me away from this location. So what I did is I set up a series of images. These are all regular paying clients, um, but I offered them this special unique location, and we tried different times of the day. Now, the first time of the day, now every day was different. We certainly cannot predict weather because, honestly, if I could predict weather, I'd probably be in a different uh, job right now <laughs> and probably be very financially successful. So um, I'm going to work on that. But right now, every day was kind of a crapshoot. We had no idea what was going to happen and how it was going to look. So I'm going to go through some different days and show you sort of the results of what's happening. This first series of images were all shot in the mid-afternoon, so between noon and 2 o'clock. So that would be considered the worst time of day to be out there and in this case there were no clouds in the sky and this is something that you have to consider as well because um, in addition to not being able to predict weather I can't make the clouds roll in which in some cases it would sure be nice because clouds create depth and dimension so this first image you're looking at here as you can see um, and we did include the metadata as well so you could actually see what lens and what choices so if you have any questions about why I choose what I choose um, we can go from there um, you can see that I was using the 24 to 105. Now, in this case, this is bright as you can get sunny. In fact, this was the sunniest, hottest day that we had up there. And you can see, uh, unfortunately, on top of that, these are beautiful blonde-haired folks. So that sun, that kicker, is just coming in and blasting the side of them. Now, hopefully, um, I know on this TV it looks a little blown out. Hopefully, you're seeing a little more clear picture of that because certainly it's not blown out as this seems to look. Um, but what we're looking at is ratios here. The flash, using that two flash system, is able to balance the exposure on the face with the exposure in the environment. As you know, if you were to go out here with no flash system, your reading would be you know, F16, F22 for that background. Now their face, because of the placement of the sun, would be probably F8 or F, you know, maybe F11. So you're gonna have a couple stops difference in that exposure. So this flash is what's making that decision. Now I was shooting TTL, this is high speed sync, so I was letting the camera and the flash make all the decisions. That is really new for me. I have always been a manual shooter. I've shot for 25 years and I was old school taught you do everything. You don't trust the camera, you make all the decisions. So biggest part of this test was really helping me overcome that hang up I have of that old school, I'm in charge of everything. So it was just amazing. Simply by using this little uh, transmitter here, you have the options to make decisions, to make uh, changes on over or under exposing your images. So just by selecting this plus or minus button and going down, I can go three stops under, I can go three stops over. So as I shot my first test shot, white bounced my camera with the flash, shot my first test shot, if I felt like it was overexposed, I could just quickly on my uh, transmitter, I could quickly take it under two stops, three stops if I needed, and I could find that balance. And that's what this is all about, is allowing the camera to make that kind of a decision gives you the opportunity to be more creative. I do shoot on a tripod, so keep in mind that gives me the ability to get those expressions because I've got my camera stable, I've got everything in place, and I'm able to move in and out. One uh, hint I'd like to give you is the flashes are placed as close to the subject as possible always. The closer they are, the less battery you're going to use. And that's important, especially if you're shooting in this bright sun. You're going to need a ton of power to make this happen. So keep that in mind. Um, so we're going to go through. Here's another image of the kids just to show you a little variation. Super bright, sunny day. Um, great balance between the exposure on the face and the exposure on the background. Now, I've never been a fan of that overly flashed fill. Um, but in this case, you couldn't shoot up here if you didn't have that kind of, of option, if you couldn't provide that much light to balance that out. Here's another image here. This is a cute little family. Same, a different day actually, but the same feel. Very hot, very bright, very sunny. Um, darker complexions, darker hair. A little more natural. You can see that the blondes tend to really blow out, and that is honestly... Um, just the reality of hair color. I mean, when you're dealing with, dealing with darker complexions, you can see <coughs> the catch lights and the separation, um, what we would call the separator or the kicker, which in this case is the sun, a lot more natural, a lot less aggressive. So I like this a little bit better, but obviously I don't, um, in addition to not controlling weather, I can't control hair color either. So you have to work with what you're given. And in every day of my life, I walk into a situation and I, there are a lot of variables I can't control. 
But using these tools, especially with this new Canon system, gives me the opportunity to control exposure. And that's what it's all about. So this is a cute little family, more interactive. I am off tripod here. I'm playing around um, down low, leaning in. Uh, this family is also the final one. This is also um, high speed sync, very, very bright time of the day. Uh, very hot out there and you can see that darker complexion creates a softer, a darker hair I should say, creates a softer more natural kicker uh, with no blowouts, beautiful location. This is something that for years and years I could not do because the tools did not exist. Unless they had a massively long extension cord and some power, it was just not going to happen. So I'm very, very excited about this work and I'm still learning and tweaking it a little bit. Here's another image. Um, and. <laughs> this is again super bright, sunny day, not a cloud in the sky. Wish there was, um, but this is what you know what you get. And again, normally I wouldn't love that flash feel to it, but I couldn't even shoot up here without that. If I tried to balance for, if I tried to expose for their face, if I did a meter reading on their face, let's say it was f8, this sky out here would be pitch pitch, or I should say, totally white, burned out no detail you wouldn't even see the mountains back there it would just look horrible and burned out so you have to make some choices and sacrifices to get that a good exposure on their face to get that beautiful blue sky i had to use a very high powered flash a lot of flash power uh to balance that out so uh i love i am just having a ball with this this is giving me options to shoot anytime anywhere i mentioned no clouds you can see this image here um, i literally fought for this cloud i moved the family and once i got the family close to the cloud i kept moving my camera until i got that cloud behind their head because a simple cloud can create more depth in the image i'm going to go back to the image with no cloud you can kind of see it behind them but you can see it's just kind of a, a blue oasis and there's not a lot of feel where just that simple cloud makes it seem much more realistic and makes it seem less over flashed and it's really interesting how that works but these are the same exact spots same exact exposure for the most part um, just really the difference of that cloud and um, having a little more depth and dimension so that is super sunny day no clouds now here's the same type of day or same time of day mid afternoon um, but there's clouds now, so we have a lot more control. So you can see in this first image, still super bright outside. But what I'm doing is I'm shooting at um, 2,500 of a second at 6.3 um, at the ISO is 1250. Now, I could have dropped the ISO down, but in this case, the clouds were getting dark and then they were opening up. So uh, my goal was to get the shots. Uh, this is a lovely family I've worked with, and they've just added a new baby. And you can see there's an age difference here. So the baby becomes my primary focus. So I don't want to mess around with equipment too much because I want to make sure that I am getting um, the baby's expression. And that was key. And he wasn't in a super great mood that day too. So I was really focusing on my target, which is the baby. But you can see, look at the difference that the clouds make from that image before with a single little cloud, that sliver of cloud, all of a sudden there's this beautiful depth. I wish I could make that happen, um, but that is mother nature. She's the boss of that. Here's another few images. You can see the different exposures. This also is considered, a, it was a, a, a sunny slash cloudy in Colorado. It rolls in and out so fast, it's kind of hard to keep up with. So you can see this image here, um, and this is that couch concept that we talked about, taking a pretty couch and throwing it out in a unique environment, kind of gives it that cool juxtaposition where it's kind of, why did you do that? And why, why are you making that happen? And our clients love it. Um, we have our clients absolutely rave about the concept. This is a great seller. And this is also a marketing piece that you can get on You Can Do and SPU as well. It comes in your package in SPU uh, when we run this campaign. But you can see uh, this. I wanted to talk about the flash. Um, if you can see these images clearly, I did mention that we were using, this is the setup here, two flashes, super bright sunny day, bare flash. So there's no modifier or anything on this. So when you look at these images, the one thing that I know somebody's going to call me out on is the heavy shadow um, that is created on in mo by mom's hair or mom's head on each of these images. Now that is the downside of using a directional flash like that is you do run the risk of shadow. So what we recommend for using flash is you're going to have the flash slightly higher than the subject and slightly angled down. What that does, whatever you're shooting, whether it's a big extended family, a wedding, small group, whatever it is, I try to go about uh, slightly above head height, slightly angled down. What that does is it pushes the shadows into the natural shadow area of the body. So if the light's coming from here and there's a shadow in here, that's going to look like part of that, that uh, client's body. So we try to control that. In this case, it was a little over flashed. 
Um, later on, we're going to actually show you in another presentation how to fix when you over flash like that. How do you blend that in? It's very easy. Erin is aces at this, and she can kind of show you a way to soften those shadows. You're actually not going to remove them. It's not that you're going to try to get rid of them, but you can soften them so they naturally gradiate across the body, and then they look like a natural shadow as opposed to that really harsh shadow. So again, these are all tests and trials, and I'm learning too, um, but these are, you know, this is me figuring out what I like and what I don't like so that next year when I go out to do this, it's going to be easy for me. And then finally, you can see got a little sunnier here, but you still got that cool cloud feel. Um, very, very windy day. You can see a little bit of wind going. Uh, important to try to turn the bodies, especially with females, into the wind. So you, at least if you're going to have windy hair, it looks more like a model session as opposed to, you know, a witch or something with the hair flying all over. So um, that's just uh, more sunny, a little brighter. And then finally, uh, this was my favorite shot of the series. This is the family down on the ground. I loved the look, the feel, the clouds. We've got that great kicker. And I just want to keep driving home. You cannot get that without this powerful flash. And that's why having this flash system, this Canon system, has just been incredible because I can just see any time of the day I can create this kind of work. This was probably shot, I'm betting it around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So tough time of the day to be out on a hill with no coverage otherwise. And then one last one, this is just the kids alone. Um, this is that more environmental work that we love to show. And, um, you know, I'm just loving the feel of this. And this is, to me, a beautiful 40-inch portrait above a fireplace. And, and that's what we're going for. So um, now we're going to go into the sunset images. So this is later in the day. And we're going to go to no clouds. So in th these images, there was not a cloud in the sky. This was one of those super sunny days. And now we're hitting the sunset hour. You can see without clouds in the sky, um, and this is late. This is literally 20 minutes before the sun is gone. So these are the very latest points of the day. You can see without a cloud, you lose a little bit of that direction. In fact, in just a minute, we'll show you images with clouds and really the unique difference. Um, but all of a sudden, you're getting that richness, that amber-orange color that, that makes you feel like it's a sunset. This is bar none the most beautiful time of the day. When we hit that timing, we try to get there one hour before the sun is down, and you start really speeding things up as that sun's going. You've got about 30 minutes to where it's you know pretty easy, uh, easy and even. And then all of a sudden, everything amplifies and your light is changing by the second. This is where having the Canon system is really going to be incredible because it's going to make decisions for you. Uh, using TTL, it is actually going to constantly evaluate what's going on and it's going to make adjustments as the sun is setting. So this is, again, why I... I'm learning to switch over to trust my camera, to trust the tool, and let it make a few of those decisions. And at any time, if I feel like it's not quite there, if I feel like it's over or under, that the camera's just not quite reading it right, I can make adjustments up here. Keep in mind, when you shoot directly into the sun like that, if that sun starts to line up, you're going to throw the camera. It's going to see all that big, bright sun, and it's going to try to make adjustments for it. So, so you may have to do a little tweaking um, there as well. And those are things that I've been learning. Uh, here's another, the same family, same time. Uh, this is probably one of the last shots that we were able to capture uh, before that sun went down. So this is super, super late in the afternoon. I love the feel of this type of work. I love the color and the, the, the warmth of these images. Here's another one. This is about the same sunset time, slightly earlier. So you can see that um, no clouds in the sky, uh, not quite that amber glow. The sun is not quite directionally behind them as well. So if I go back an image, you can see a little bit of haziness through here. This is a flare. It's, it's being caused. It's over on mom's side and the daughter's side. Just a slight discoloration. I always call it a graying or a hazing. Um, that is the flare kicking back in where this next family, as you see, uh, I turned them a little out a little bit more. So you see a stronger kicker here. Uh, but you don't see that hazy, uh, grayish feel to the image. Now, that can, we're going to talk about that in a minute. That could be a positive thing as well. But when you're looking for a beautiful 40-inch, 50, 60-inch portrait, you want a good, clean capture. And sometimes that hazy can throw the, the skin color off as well. So these were all sunset images, no clouds in the sky. The next series are sunset images, clouds in the sky. Now, this is, to me, the premium look. I can't control it. I can't pick when that's going to happen, but you can see what's happening in these images. Uh, this was a great, remember we talked earlier when we were talking about body posing and making things work? This happens to be a couch session, so I know I mentioned not to take fancy furniture out, but in this case it works. I have a small couch 
and I have a bar stool, a tall bar stool. So what that does is it helps me create design and depth. We have a nice little V going here. We have a nice little V going here. And that's what we're trying to do in photography is create those um, reverse or natural Vs and create, you know, we've got a little family image here. We've got a beautiful couple image here. We've got a great little horizontal family image here. So in a perfect large family portrait, you should be able to extract. The rule is you should be able to extract each person out at a minimum of a three-quarter portrait. So if you look at this, I've got dad, I've got baby. All the way through, I could take every single person out and have a nice portrait of them. So this is very similar to what we want to teach you is how to lay out portraits. This image right here, this family, um, I don't have the exact size, but I believe this is going to be a very big one. It'll probably be a 50 or 60 inch portrait that they're ordering because they loved this. Now, if this was the whole family crammed together, um, everybody's standing, squeezing in tight, there's no way they would consider a 60 inch portrait. That's a very large portrait. So in order to sell wall portraits, we want to show a little more depth, a little more expanse. We want to give them a reason. Another rule in photography is the head in a portrait should never be, in a, in a wall portrait, should never be larger than a clock, a face of a clock, or uh, your palm of your hand is what I like to remember. So if I blow this up, I could probably blow this up to 80 inches, and their heads total would be about that big. They'd be about this size. So I would not be breaking that rule. So again, by giving myself more room to work with, I then can um, have that control to show them a beautiful portrait, to really show them that in order to enjoy this portrait, they're going to need to have it pretty big. Um, here's probably one of my very favorite shots of the entire series taken that night as well. Uh, I love everything about this. I love the clouds. I love the depth. There's a little bird out in the sun because it's coming directly back in, but to me, the sacrifice with the amber glow. Now, I am using the flash system. On the flashes, this is probably something for another class, uh, you have a zoom on a flash, and that gives you uh, options as far as how wide you want your light to fall. So if you zoom it in, you can actually have a tighter um, fill, and then of course as you zoom it out, you can create a, a wider depth of light. So I was playing around a little bit with this because I wanted to see, I wanted to create more of a darker foreground and darker outside and really almost spotlight the subject so they were kind of glowing to match the, uh, the background. So hopefully that uh, image works for you, but this is definitely one of my favorites. This is what we call a happy accident. Um, the kids were getting tired and they were running around and, and uh, the baby at this age, typically babies don't want their hands held at this age, but we happened to, she happened to, then we were kind of struggling making this happen, but for a tenth of a second, they were able to grab her hands and I think we either threw something or dad called their name. We got the shot and that's a keeper to me. This is also one that's in consideration for a very large wall portrait. Um, I can assure you that when this is finished, it will be a wall portrait in my studio as well. This is one that I feel like we really nailed it couple more families. Uh, this is late, late sunset. That sun is 10 seconds away from disappearing. So you can see that you've got that haze. There's a little bit of it coming back at the camera. This one has that more over flash feel. In fact, I'm going to go back. You can see this is a little softer and blends a little nicer with the three kids. Going forward, a little harsher. Still beautiful. The clients loved it, but definitely has a much stronger flash because my light is changing so fast that I'm making, um, the camera is actually making decisions to compensate for that. So this is right before the sun sets. And you can actually see uh, in the corner of the frame, there's actually the, the light stand. Because again, using these flashes, you keep them as close as you can to the subject. The further they are away, the more power they're going to have to draw, the more you're going to kill your batteries. And then this is directly after that sun dropped down. You can see that it changed up. Now it definitely has a very strong flash to it. Everything else has gone dark. We have more of a spotlight feel. Um, I like this. I don't, I wouldn't say I love it. It's not, I love the image and I love this family. I've been photographing actually all of these families since their children were babies, but, um, it's just a little more dramatic, a little different. And it's, it's something that I think works really, really well. All right. Now we're going to talk a little bit about, about flare and shadow. Let me just check my time here. We're doing good. We're going to take a break uh, in just a few minutes, but let's talk about flare and shadow and dealing with difficult light situations. This is that last family. <clears throat> and this is the sun is just a little bit higher. So you can see that what I did is I positioned them so the sun is directly behind them. So of course now you've lost the mountains, you've lost that, uh, that depth in the background. You've got a little bit of cloud coverage, which is nice, but what you are getting is that strong shadow in the foreground. By putting the light directly behind them, it's pushing that shadow forward. The full frame of this image, you can't see it here, but those shadows actually extend quite a bit further. It has kind of a cool look to it as those 
uh, shadows become leading lines. So this is not a wall portrait cell. This is not something that I feel like would be, um, you know, a 40, 50, 60 inch portrait, but this is definitely a great collection piece, a, a series piece, an album piece, or maybe something that would go on the back of a holiday card or something like that. It shows a little more interaction and a little more, um, a little more relationship style work. Now here is the same family. Now we're going to talk about flair because this is early. We're still, we're in the couch series and now I'm trying to angle the camera, but you can see that sun is kicking back. So there's kind of a wash over. In fact, you can see it coming right in the oldest son's, uh, right on his shoulder. You can see a lock, lack of color there. And that is because um, we've got that flare coming from the sun. Now there is a fine line between good flare and bad flare. And it truly is an artistic decision. You actually have to decide what you think is appropriate. Does this work for you? Does it not work for you? That's, it's really a personal thing. What's more important though is does it work for your client? Is a client gonna look at that and say, oh my gosh, that's beautiful, or ooh, his shirt is a different color. I mean, in an eight by 10, nobody would notice it. If you blew this up to a 60 inch portrait, I can assure you his shirt would turn green. It would look very weird. There would be a, a round cutout shape on it and it would probably bother the client. And to fix something like that is almost impossible. Retouching that out because it's, it's a natural part of the flare. You can see it in her hair as well. Uh, would be tough. So when I'm shooting these, I'm very careful. I want to get some artistic shots, um, but I also want to be aware that ultimately I need a perfectly lit image for that wall portrait. Here's another use of flare. Um, we call this artistic flare. This is a choice that I made. I tried to drop the sun directly behind them. You can see it's directly behind dad because his pants are almost ghosting out there. Uh, do I love it? Yeah, I think it's really cool. I think this would look great on a holiday card or just a, a, a collection of images. I probably would not want to see this as a 40 or 50 or 60 um, because I know there'd be degradation in some of the color and I, you know, clients would probably, once it was really big, they might not like it as much. So 